Hello, everyone. My name's Haley Blackburn, and I work as a student success coach in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Northern Colorado. Now, this is my first career position after graduating uh, two and a half times over from Colorado State University. I'm currently finishing up a PhD in journalism and media communication while learning the ins and outs of working, like working, working. And this lecture video just describes my experiences with connecting and networking at work. I hope that it helps you prepare for your careers too. Now you may have covered elevator pitches during your professional development and res resume writing sections for your courses. Um, and I really truly find that my elevator pitch is a trusted friend and tool that I pull out of my pocket every single day, way beyond, you know, formal networking events. While a lot of emphasis is on, hey, you went to a networking event, you need to be ready. Like, honestly, I never went to networking events sort of in that formal fashion, but I have used my elevator pitch just constantly. And I do feel like it's helped me build that connection. Like I know what I'm going to say because I have it sort of figured out and rehearsed. Um, and whenever I can get through those first, you know, the opening kind of sentences, then the communication and the conversation is just able to flow kind of moving forwards. Um, and so I do have a lot of variations just based on my audience, like the medium that I'm working in. So I use a different kind of version of an elevator pitch if I'm on the phone or if I'm writing an email or if I'm actually meeting somebody in person and of course the purpose as well. Um, and so the main things that I think about with elevator pitches, at least in my experience so far, is that it's important just to have a few sentences containing your key identifiers, right? It's things like tell people your name, your title, especially, and the projects that you think are going to resonate with that person or the group. Um, and so that's where a lot of the change comes in. Because in my job, right, sometimes I'm collaborating with other people with similar positions on specific projects across campus. Uh, but then the next time I'll be meeting with like a new faculty member and talking and trying to help them out. And then I also meet with current students at UNC, but I also meet with visiting students. And so each time I have to change sort of that back end of my elevator pitch to resonate with them and kind of build up that rapport and connection. Um, and Kind of like I mentioned, like these variations of the elevator pitches, like I use it constantly because I'm always meeting new people in my job, both internal and external. And really, I've just found that the networking, it doesn't stop once you get the job. It really actually becomes even more important after you're in that career, especially if it's a space you hope to continue progressing your career in. Um, and if you, you know, get in with a company that maybe you want to stay with for a while and try to kind of rise the ranks. So it'll be really important to be able to build those connections with those people. So I recommend taking a few minutes now to kind of give yours a try. So you heard one version of my pitch at the very beginning. I'm all right. I told you my name, my current job title, and why I'm sharing this information with you. Um, and like I mentioned, other versions just focus more on current projects or how I can help, you know, the people that I'm interacting with. Uh, so to kind of get you started and just give it a try, like pause this video and like say the things out loud because um, it gets it's like awkward at first for sure. But the more comfortable you kind of get with it, the better. All right. So as an example, let's just say you're in a meeting with several people from other departments and you need to work on a new project. So think about like what quick pitch or introduction would help you, you know, connect with those people and establish like your legitimacy in that space. So with that scenario in mind, like I'll go first. So, hi, I'm Haley Blackburn, she, her, hers, from the Student Success Resource Center in HSS. As a coach, I have connections with department heads and faculty that might be helpful with this campus project. All right, so name, title, department if applicable, and a goal, contribution, project, or something about your role that applies to the situation and why the people. So now you try. Based on the industry that you want to work in, imagine a scenario where you need to introduce yourself to new people that you're going to be working with. Oh, why are we even like bothering to talk about building connections and like networking? 
you know, after you get the job. Well, it's really important to keep building those relationships uh, because based on, you know, the source that you're reading, I know those polls or articles reflect that a majority of professionals, you know, say that networking helped progress their careers forward. So yes, it's important to like get the job in the first place. Building those connections can be really helpful. But after you have that first job, you know, it's going to be even more important to help you get to that next step in your career goals, having people around you, mentors, people that are really familiar with your work, um, and even beyond like your work itself, having those really positive associations with the people and kind of building up that reputation and rapport is what's going to, you'll be really helpful as you look higher and higher into your career ladder. Um, and, you know, ultimately like building those connections with your peers and, importantly, continuing to network with people above you, it's likely going to generate future opportunities. So for example, for me, like I was actually recently asked to lead a committee that I'm really excited about. It's really important for my career progression to have this opportunity and added to my like resume as well as just getting um, the skills and experiences. Um, and I was asked to lead this committee in part because I'm really active in the group chats, which is like appropriate contributions. And I have taken the time to connect with with people kind of beyond what I sort of necessarily need to do for my current job. Um, I have gone out of my way to sort of build more connections across my network. Um, and that was noticed and my name came up for this position. Um, and so while leading, you know, committees might not resonate with you and your career goals, of course. So, you know, in place of leading a committee, think about what opportunities would be good for you. And once you figure out those types of experiences and opportunities, then you can start to think about who and how, right, to connect with, to increase your chances of you getting those types of opportunities. And so really, you know, I wouldn't um, have been able to probably have this opportunity without kind of me taking the time to build up some of those relationships. Now, every day I connect with people kind of in three different sort of broad categories that we're going to take a little bit of time to go through. So the rest of this lecture is just going to talk about what I found to work um, and what I have found to like not work as well uh, when writing emails, uh, having meetings, and then, you know, phone calls with people inside my office kind of community and network. Now for email, remember, you're just the foundations of technical communication, right? People are reading because they have to, not because they want to. So do all of your coworkers a favor, keep your emails and texts focused, and it's really well designed, right? It also helps to be that person that sends really clear, purposeful emails, letting the recipient know exactly why they need to read it and what action you need them to take. And so just as that quick review of like what I find helpful in emails because I receive so many emails every day. Like really email, I send and receive them all the time. Way more than people like call me or I call other people. Um, and so whenever I get an email and it's not very focused and it's too long, it's rambly or it doesn't have good design. So thinking about how are you breaking up your paragraphs? Are you using bullet points? Are you using bold? Do you have italics? Like, how does the page, how am I supposed to read it and move forward? Um, as well as if it's missing, like, that call to action. Those are the things that annoy me. And I don't like working with those people um, because it just isn't very clear or efficient um, for us to get things done when their emails aren't focused, difficult to read, don't have a call to action. So you know, take the time to really be the person that sends those emails to others and really build up that positive kind of association so people like to work with you. Um, now, when we talk about keeping it focused, right, that doesn't mean that networking and building connection, you know, should be pushed to the side, right? Focus just means that you keep any of that friendly connection building content relevant to the topic itself um, and limit it to like one sentence, sometimes even just a phrase is enough. Right. And so just like as an example, I always appreciate when like a coworker emails me about a project and remembers something about my office life or role. Um, and again, just keep it to a sentence. So it could be something like, you know, thanks for working on this project and I hope your fish is doing well. 
because I have a beta fish in my office. So to me, that shows to them, oh, like they remember something about my office and something a little more personalized to me. But, you know, it's just one sentence. So it's not causing me to read a whole paragraph on some tangent. Um, and so I do the same as I need to other people. So sometimes to like help keep my emails focused, I'll sort of sneak that connecting information, showing them that like I know who they are and something about them because we have a connection going. And to like sometimes parentheses um, or just at the very end of the email. And in both cases, thinking about you know, document design, right? Parentheses can show that this information is viewed as sort of extra compared to the focus of the email. And so uh, like an example of when I would use a parentheses is, you know, if I'm talking about, um, you know, maybe I am talking to a prospective student and they're interested in like a degree in communication. You might, you all provide the information that they need and then parentheses you might say, and being a communication alum myself, I really enjoyed that type of work in the classes and parentheses and then here's some more information. So again, giving that opportunity for them to get to know me a little bit more um, and we can like build some rapport from there. Now, the biggest thing though, right, we don't want to be a robot in our email. Sometimes I can come off a little bit too harsh and direct and, you know, being seen as too harsh or direct, oh, excuse me, too harsh and direct doesn't necessarily, um, you know, provide the the most positive relationship building roles. Um, but we also don't want it to be forced and we don't want to be like stuffing our emails with just, you know, non-essential, like try hard kind of stuff either. So at the end of the day, you know, you just have to find that balance. And it also depends on how many times you've emailed that person, how well you know them, you know, their role, the project you're working on. So unfortunately, there's no like hard, you know, set rule you can memorize here. It really is being able to read your audience, thinking about your purpose, um, and just picking up on the social cues of your office and your, you know, corporate culture that you're working in. Um, but at the end of the day, I'd say like you can either be known as the person who sends good emails or the person that we all dread opening up your messages because they're one long paragraph and rambling and confusing. So when it comes to building connections at work through email, like try to be the one that's the good communicator so people not necessarily look forward to, but at least don't have a, a eye rolling, um, you know, uh, an eye roll when they see your name pop up in their inbox. Now, I like to begin my emails with something, you know, like this, right? I'm a success coach and the finder of answers for the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, right? So again, it's like my elevator pitch, right? I'm identifying, you know, my, myself, my role, kind of what I do, how I help them, and who I work for. And of course, in an email, like, they see my name already in the, um, the from line, and also my signature will be at the bottom. And so it's less important in an email to say, like, my name's Haley, right? Because they can see what your name will be. Um, and then after my introduction, I like to just, you know, state why they're getting the email or, you know, what I'm hoping they can get out of it. So something like you requested X information, here is the follow-up. Or this email contains the policy updates that you need to know about. Or please find the information on, you know, the project. Um, and if it's someone that I've, like, met with before, um, and so it's a little bit more informal because I do know that person, then I like to remind them, like, how we know each other. So that's where reinforcing, like, that connection building, remind them. So they'd say something like, oh, we met two weeks ago about the, you know, committee on the event planning. And I'm checking in on how things are going. You know, how are you feeling about finishing up these tasks or next week, you know, what can I clarify for you based on what we talked about? Now, texting and I am like, at least personally in my work, we use uh, Microsoft Teams all the time in these platforms, you know, Slack, all those are more and more common across the business sector. Um, and so with it, I found, you know, it's not really different than a group chat with my friends. You know, you want to use the same general etiquette. Um, so it's things like, don't be the person blowing up, right, the chat needlessly. 
you don't have to respond to every single thing someone says. Um, you know, respond when you need to respond and respond when you actually have something that you can contribute to the conversation. So for example, if someone asks a question that doesn't apply to you or you can't help them with, like you don't need to send a message saying, oh, you can't help. Like your non-response to their question will imply that without prompting, you know, the ding on everyone's computer. Uh, and, you know, as always with technical communication, again, like consider your audience, right? Your group chat might have people from a range of backgrounds. So be mindful about your memes and the gifts that you send. Like I definitely still send them in the group chat, but it's on like very specific and intentional instances, um, you know, and I definitely really think about the context of that gif and obviously the content of it and um, putting a little bit more thought into how it might be received. Um, and so I tend to just stick with, um, you know, very overtly sort of friendly and, and not snarky um, memes and gifts. For, you don't want to be mindful about that. Um, I also use uh, the message interactions a lot. And so the most common one is, you know, the like button. We use this all the time in the chat, um, really just to acknowledge the significance of a post. And I continue to think about, okay, like, who am I interacting with? And do they like need that? Am I liking everyone's post? Because that's like, you know, don't be that person either. Um, and so use it to really acknowledge some sort of significance there. Um, sometimes people use the sad face or the laughing face when it's like actual meaningful for them. And on very rare occasions, we do use the heart um, emoji. I tend to only use the heart though when somebody mentions me and like work that I've done. So it's kind of like acknowledging praise, honestly, um, is where I find like the heart button to be helpful for me. Now, when it comes to meetings, there are six things that I've observed and learned to make them work for me and to really like stand out as, you know, a, a person that they can pay attention to. And so first, showing up early to mingle. And by early, I've learned, uh, at least, you know, within my company culture, you'll figure out what that means at the places you work for. For me, like showing up early to a meeting is two to three minutes. Anything more than that, probably like the conference room will have some previous meeting in it or you're going to be sitting like by yourself um or it's just going to be awkward so like three minutes is definitely plenty early at least i found um and only show up those three minutes early like if there's somebody there that i really plan to mingle with because otherwise you're both just sitting there super like and I just like awkwardly it's like why are you spending those extra minutes just to like sit there quietly and so you know look at who is on the in invite list if your company is using you know outlook um you can see you can go to like the tracking tab and see who is scheduled to attend the meeting um and then you know maybe try to show up early to talk to them a little bit um or whoever's sitting there you know, learn something about your coworkers. um but again anything more than three minutes and it becomes that like weird time period of like too much time for small talk but like not enough time to really get to know someone anyway two to three minutes is probably all you need to get that mingling in uh second right bringing the supplies which means always having access to you know my calendar to do list notes I like to bring a physical notepad, um, but I also bring you know, my phone because it has my calendar, my email, my to-do list on it. So I can always, if somebody has a question, right, I can be that person with the answer. Uh, third, I found it really helpful to outline the topics um, that I want to mention, right? And so now, again, I'm building this association within my network of like, I come with a purpose and I'm going to speak up when I have something to say and it just keeps me really organized. And so, you know, I, it's easier and better for me to make sure I get all the updates that I wanted to get out, you know, in. Um, and then with that, like I have a special, um, like meeting notepad basically, and it has, you know, different kind of segments on the page. Um, and you know, I had, right, my 
company order it for me as just part of my office supplies and I find it to be really helpful. So you could ask about that. Otherwise, you know, just on a normal notebook paper, um, I find it really helpful to write uh, the date of the meeting, the topic of the meeting or like who you're meeting with and then the attendees. And on that note, like take the attendees and like take some notes during the introduction. Right? So earlier right, we practiced like the elevator pitch for your meeting introductions. Um, but like while everyone else is take giving their introductions, I find it helpful, especially at first or if there's a new face in the room to note down, okay, what was their title and what department were they from? So that way I can go back and like remember and follow up appropriately. Um, and then lastly, just setting dates for any action items. So during the meeting, if somebody says, hey, we need this done, and like I volunteer, um, obviously go ahead and writing down the date when that needs to be done and um, putting it in my to-do list right away. Uh, a lot of people do this, so I wouldn't say it's like a faux pas, because at least in my observations and in my company culture, again, it might be different for yours, um, you know, having your phone out to actually put this, you know, item in your to-do list is not like a bad thing or found upon thing. It's really common. And yeah, you know, in a, one way, I think it reassures people that you actually are going to follow up and be that dependable person. All right. Seriously, though, like practice your introduction, practice this version of your elevator pitch. Um, Because one time, like, I, oof. It was just, I felt like it was really awkward um, because it was one of like the first meetings I hadn't really like gotten my intro down smoothly yet. And so every time I stumbled over it, it's just like, oh gosh, that was not the, um, the way at, and first impression I wanted to make. Um, and I probably lost some opportunities to connect with people in the room that I'm much higher up because now I'm just like, you know, who is this person? Um, and without a strong and like confident introduction, you know, it kind of sounds like maybe you don't belong in that space. You're not as, um, yeah, like, like confident. And so it's good to just really practice that. So again, general rule of thumb, right? Name, title, and department if you're working across departments, um, and your pronouns, right? Uh, again, this depends on your company culture. As I work um, at a university, and so we really want to make sure it's a welcoming, inclusive space. And part of that is just identifying your pronouns so other people don't have to assume how I like to be identified. Um, but this is a thing that legitimately I've had to practice because I wasn't used to saying my pronouns, as many of us aren't. Um, and then it's also awkward if everybody else says your pronouns, but then like I forget to and it just like makes it weird. So definitely keep practicing that. Um, and so, you know, in a meeting space, you, know, you don't want to take, you know, a whole minute, right? It's not your whole elevator pitch. It really is much more like go around the room and everyone's like, you know, hi, I'm Haley Blackburn, student success coach in humanities and social sciences, she, her, hers. And then it goes to the next person and they introduce themselves. Um, but when I'm saying my introduction, right, it's important that I make eye contact with people around the room, especially people that I haven't met before. Um, so that way, you know, we start to build a little connection there. Um, and then it's also important just to consider your volume, right? If it's a really big meeting space, you know, I've been in meetings with 20 people got to project a lot more than when I'm in, you know, our tiny conference room with just the five of us, um, you know, from the, the dean's office or something. So in the end, practice. And this, the more you get used to saying your name, your title, and your pronouns out loud, the easier it gets to be in, you know, the, the more of like just kind of second nature it will become and the more like confident and strong that you'll sound. Um, now, especially right now, remote meetings are very much a must do, right? And they're mostly the same, I'd say, as any other meetings, with just a few kind of tweaks that I've noticed. And so kind of, again, as far as like, like you're not going to sign into a remote meeting early to mingle with people. Like there's just not really that opportunity. Um, but I would say just like be ready two to three minutes before the call time. And so by that, I like, you know, have my um, Teams chat set up. I got my web camera like where I want it to be. I've tested my mic, my volume. Um, I have my notes in front of me. I have any windows that I think 
might be helpful. Uh, and I definitely have muted notifications as well, so I don't get like interrupted. So just have everything ready a couple of minutes before. Um, if you're the host of the meeting, then obviously like like have have that ready and open so other people can log in. Um, but if you're waiting for somebody to like let you in, if you're in the virtual waiting room, you know, like be ready a minute or two beforehand so that way um, the meeting can start right on time. And that's really the biggest thing I've noticed, like just like, um, you know, in class, right? If class starts at nine o'clock, you can roll in at 8.59, sit down, and then class pretty much starts 9, 9.01. Um, in meetings, i found, maybe, and maybe it's because I work in higher ed, so we're still, you know, on that, like, time, time thing. But, uh, yeah, if the meeting's at 10, like, people start the meeting at 10, whether you're there or not. So just make sure you get there on time and you're ready. Um, second, check your background and avoid backlighting, right? So like right now, obviously we're all working from home. So it's just important. I just have like a plain kind of white background. Um, so that's kind of, that's good. You don't want it to be like, you know, distracting or anything. Um, and when it comes to window lighting, just make sure that you don't have a backlight on it. So make sure the light is coming like towards your face and isn't behind you because otherwise your camera is going to pick up all the backlighting. And just like when you try to, you know, take a photo in front of a window and then you just get like a, a silhouette and nobody can see you, same thing's going to happen in your remote meeting. Um, third, align the program window with the camera. Right, so if you are going to use the camera, which I found like and it's kind of 50 50, some people do, some people don't. Um, it doesn't really seem to matter or like impact things. Um, if you just want to use the audio, like that is definitely, I think, fine. Um, but if you are using the camera, just make sure that, um, you know, you have it set up so you can be looking directly into the camera and kind of like quasi making eye contact with people and not looking like away all the time. So if you do have, you know, a window open that you need to be following along with, maybe it's the agenda or your notes or something, um, have it lined up with your camera so you can like be looking at both, but your face is still kind of facing the same way. Um, I also like to open the chat window, at least in Microsoft Teams, because um, sometimes people will, you know, post questions or comments to the chat rather than interrupting whoever is speaking. Um, but that's not always open by default. So just make sure you get that open. Um, fifth, uh, and this, you know, obviously with um, remote meetings, it's a lot easier to like talk over people because you don't have quite the same, you know, like nonverbal cues to go off of. Um, and so whenever somebody else is talking and, you know, they're explaining their project or whatnot, I do like to mute my microphone. So that way, if, you know, my dog starts barking or um, just something comes up, my phone rings, it's not disruptive to the meeting because my microphone's muted. And then when I do need to speak, right, then I unmute it, say the thing, mute it again. Um, it's just kind of nice sort of meeting um, etiquette. Uh, and then six, you know, just prepare like a local meeting, right? So if you were going to walk into your conference room, right, still have your notes, um, still pay attention to who is attending and just be ready to go. Ooh, all right. So I never used to like to talk on the phone and now I actually love um, when people call and answering the phone. I've definitely personally gotten a lot more comfortable with calling other people as well. Um, and so with phone calls, same thing, right? That one minute elevator pitch, start building those connections, explain who you are, and then get to the point. So um, if I, you know, have to call over to some other department, um, again, kind of depending on who it is, um, but with phone calls, it's like, Often I, you know, I'm calling the same person so I can make my one sentence intro shorter and shorter, but I still like to reinforce it because that person talks to a lot of people every day too. So it's something like, uh, you know, especially if I'm calling like an internal person. Hi, this is Haley Blackburn in the Student Success Resource Center over at HSS, right? Okay. And then they're like, oh yeah, even though my name's also on the caller ID, I just like to reinforce it to be that person's like, oh yeah, hi, how are you? Right. 
and I'm calling an external person, you know, then it, it's a little bit shorter because they don't necessarily, especially if I'm talking to like a student, need to know like my full department and everything. Um, and so I usually shorten it to like, hi, this is Haley Blackburn calling from UNC looking for and then the name of the person I'm looking for so they can identify and then I can go from there. Um, and then next, you know, engage in very, very light small talk, similar to an email. It's like, you don't want to just like be going on and on, but you also don't have to get like super abrupt either. And so I've observed and just found that, you know, the typical kind of small talk things, you know, how are you this morning? And they'll be like, oh, you know, it's pretty busy. How are you doing? And you're like, yeah, I feel that. So I'm calling about, you know, build a little connection, build a little rapport, ask them how things are going. Um, and the more that you kind of get uh, familiarized with that person too, you know, the more you can talk about. So there's like one person that um, I don't call regularly, but you know, we probably end up in meetings together or I need to call this person like uh, once or twice a month. Um, and so I know I've learned this person um, really enjoys like Star Wars and I also like Star Wars. And so that's a nice thing that whenever I do see or like call this person, I'm able to kind of follow up with like, oh yeah, how are you going? Did you, you know, catch the new episode of The Mandalorian, right? When that was, you know, coming out or now, ah, uh, how's it been without any Star Wars? Now, of course, now there's not new Star Wars out. You know, I have to continue building a connection with this person and kind of find the next thing to talk about because you also don't want to just always talk about that one thing. But it was really nice um, that I was able to find that connection point um, and use that for, you know, quite a while. Like when the Mandalorian was coming out, every time I talked to them, we had, you know, a like 20, 30 second sort of micro conversation about it. And that was really cool. Um, and then, you know, get to the business, right? You're calling for a reason. They are busy as well. So then get to it. What are you calling about? Get for the information. Move on. Now, when it comes to voicemail, um, I set up my voicemail with yet another variation of my sort of elevator pitch and introduction. Um, and so, you know, that's just like an important, helpful thing. Like, again, I'm identifying who I am so they know like where they called, kind of loosely like why I didn't answer and how to get in contact with me or who else to call. And then kind of the last thing I would just, like, I found to be really helpful that sometimes maybe um, doesn't get used as often is, like, leverage your socials, right? And so I know, like, if there's a lot of conversation sometimes about, like, you know, you obviously need to be digital savvy and, like, think about what you're posting and set things to private because, yeah, your employer literally might look you up. Um, but I found, like, leveraging my socials also means, um, like, creating maybe even like a more professional account. So like on Instagram, all right, I have set it up to be more oriented towards like my academic and PhD circles. Um, but I also, you know, follow, you know, others like higher education accounts. So for me to be industry related means being tapped into higher education stuff. Um, and so then I get a lot of content that way. Um, but then I also like, I follow a lot of, you know, like, food and and fitness and things like that oh but it still ties into my brand like if you go and read on my linkedin profile or my personal website like it it all connects right the things that i talk about on linkedin like do show up on my instagram account because those are the things that i care about and the values that i have um and like i personally don't have a second um Instagram account because I just don't really like to post that many personal things or anything like that. Um, and everything I do post, I just make sure that it's like sticking with my more like professional side of my brand. Um, so, you know, use it that way. Follow those industry accounts. Like think about what you're posting and is this something with your in line with your career goals? Is it not? And you, you know, can be the one to make that decision. Um, but I would definitely just recommend, like, think about how you can brand yourself for the job that you want and to be in line with that. And when you are posting with career goals in mind, like, tag strategically. Like, you know, tag using hashtags or actually tagging these industry-related accounts or your company if it's something that you want 
you know, somebody to notice that you're up to and that you're doing and that you're adding all this value, you know, in your free time. And on that note, absolutely. I hope that you do connect with me. Like you can find, you know, my personal website. I use it as a bit of a portfolio. Again, the industry I'm in portfolios are more um, common because I've just done a lot of projects um, that uh, often people want to see like examples of my work. Um, you can also follow me on LinkedIn. I'm on YouTube with um, other just like lecture and video content from when I used to teach. Um, and also on Instagram and Twitter, like definitely connect. One thing you'll notice is, right, I've created this very, like I've created a brand, right? So everything is this H-Y-L-Y-B, just make it easy to to find me across platforms. And so again, always thinking about like career goals in mind. All right, follow me, DM me, ask me questions. Uh, I definitely want to hear from you. Let me know your tips as well. And just thank you for um, listening. And I hope that we can network and connect into the future.